Dr. Smith, this is a, a, a proffer for, for a potential appellate record, and what I'm going to do is ask you some kind of conclusory questions and, and, and uh, some summary questions to avoid your having to sit here for a long afternoon and, and all of us the same way. Okay. Um, in, the, in the process of your uh, investigation of the Maya Kowalski case after it was referred to you, did you conduct an investigation? Did you gather some medical records? I did a medical evaluation, including gathering a lot of medical records, yes. Okay. And did you, in fact, uh, promulgate two different reports? Yes. Regarding that. One was a preliminary report in October of 2016? October 13th, correct. Okay. And the other is uh, was one signed uh, December 2nd, 2016? Correct. Uh, do those reports... Uh, both indicate the results of your investigation and review to that date? Yes. Okay. And in connection with your report and uh, in, in your investigation, did you obtain certain medical records regarding Maya Kowalski? Yes. And does your report, your December, does the report you signed December 2nd, 2016, uh, fairly and accurately reflect the uh, records that you gathered and then reviewed for your report? Up until that time, yes. Okay. And then were there subsequent records you reviewed after that, after you received after that date? Yes. Okay. And uh, does your report first of October, I think you said 13th, 2016? Correct. Yes. Does it fairly and accurately reflect your conclusions up to that date? Yes. Okay. And um, that would, if, if you were, if we were to walk through that report and what, what it was based upon, uh, would you, uh, would you, your indication be that it uh, contained and, and fairly reflected the outcome and your conclusions of your investigation up to October 13th, 2016? Yes. And would it also reflect what you advise up to the, 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 the conclusions and facts of which you advise the court, the dependency court, as of that day? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to show you what we're going to mark as whatever the court clerk tells me we're going to mark it as. What's the next in the series for the defendants? 3328. For ID? For ID. It's not coming into evidence. Correct. This is 3328 for identification. And let me just ask you, is that a true and correct copy of your report? of October 13th, 2016. Yes. Okay. Can you hand that to me? Are you finished with it, Mr. Yes, Hunter? Um, Madam Clerk, it's two-sided, so just be careful. And then um, after that, after you rendered that report of 2006, these are new lips, I'm sorry. October 13th, 2016, uh, after you rendered that report, did you continue an investigation as reflected in the report that you signed on December 2nd, 2016? I continued my medical evaluation um, up to that point in December and gathered lots of additional records beyond what I had on October 13th, yes. Okay. And I have a badly marked up copy of what I'm going to ask be uh, marked for identification as defense exhibit. Well, is, is there already a specific exhibit number on that? Down at the bottom, Mr. Hunter, the first page, look at the first page. December or the October? December. The December is 1345, 46. In answer to your question, my copy doesn't, but I, I trust Mr. Uh, Mr. Hughes, will you stand up and let the clerk know what defense numbers are the two reports that have been previously marked? So the first report is an October 13, 2016 preliminary report, and it is defense exhibit number 3044. The for ID, it's not in. It's just ID. Just that for identification purposes. For identification purposes, um, Sally Smith's December 5, 2016 report is defense exhibits number 3045, and that's pages 1 through 46, and it's currently being printed. Okay. Or 
can't we just put the first that's, page that's up fine. if that, you that's, want? That's fine. Okay. I apologize to the board. No. No worries. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. And, and to the clerk for <laughs> attempting to gum up the works one more time. Um, does your December 2nd, 2016 report, uh, Defense Exhibit 3045, does it also reflect your opinions and conclusions as of that date regarding your investigation? Regarding my medical evaluation, yes. Okay. And, and just if you would briefly tell the court what your opinions were regarding this matter as reflected in that report. As reflected in that report, it was my um, conclusion that there was um, what we call positive findings for medical child abuse and um, that the medical record review and the um, history taking and that kind of thing that I had reviewed um, uh, provided very strong evidence to support that conclusion. Okay. Was there any conclusion, and is that the, the conclusion of medical child abuse would, would colloquially be known as Munchausen by proxy? Yes, and I believe it's even in the what we call the impression. That was my conclusion in the report. I, I put in parentheses Munchausen syndrome by proxy because that's kind of a, a, a well-known term for this situation. Okay. And did you reach any conclusion regarding conversion disorder? Yes. And what was that? It was my opinion based on all of the observations of the various um, medical staff and team and staff members, et cetera, as well as based on multiple um, other physicians' reports that I had reviewed that she had a conversion disorder. Did it's she... actually called a functional neurological disorder now, but, but at that time it was called a conversion disorder. And when you say she, you refer to Maya Kowalski? Maya Kowalski, yes. Okay. Um, in reaching the conclusions and opinions you've just expressed to us, um, how many pages of medical records did you review? Uh, I don't know exactly as I sit here, but well over 2,000. Okay. And I, I see you brought with you today a stack of three, four, and five inch binders that is on the table in front of you. Are those at least some of the records you reviewed? Those are all the medical records that I um, printed. So there are some that I reviewed in the electronic medical record from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital that I don't have copies of. Um, but everything that I had a copy of in terms of all her medical records going back to actually her you know, first visit to the pediatrician up in Chicago is in those binders. Okay. And did, did the material you reviewed also include certain um, online uh, WordPress blogs that had been created by Beata Kowalski? Yes. Um, I believe that's all I have, Your Honor. Mr. Anderson, do you have anything in proffer? Dr. Smith, before, or let's say, right at the start of this in the first part of October, you had a call with Dr. Kirkpatrick, did you not? I did. And Dr. Kirkpatrick explained to you that he had been treating Maya Kowalski for CRPS, correct? He did. And he told you that statistically speaking, CRPS is often mistaken for conversion or Munchausen by proxy, did he not? I don't really remember exactly what his words were. I took a few notes from the conversation that I had with him, and I know that there was some general discussion along those lines. And yet you did not put anything in your report about Dr. Kirkpatrick, did you? Yes, I believe there's a whole section about his medical records. Yeah, except for the fact that you did not tell anyone in that report that he had warned you off of going after the Kowalskis. That's. It's completely irrelevant for a child protection team medical evaluation because that's the whole point of the, of the evaluation and gathering all the records. The problem in these cases is that the treating physicians have not done that. And so the fact that he, who sent her to Mexico for the ketamine coma, told me not to investigate child abuse it was completely irrelevant to me because the, my job was to investigate child abuse. So if I had come away from my job saying, 
I was supposed to do this, but this doctor told me not to, so I'm not doing it, and there's no evidence of anything here. I would not have been doing my job even remotely near a standard of care. Do you not understand the importance of putting both sides of the story in your report? The both sides of the story is the responsibility of the various people who are going to present it to the court. My job as the medical director for the child protection team is to do what I need to do to assist the investigators and the um, detectives and the attorneys that are involved in the case as to whether there is evidence to support a diagnosis of whatever type of child abuse is being assessed. So it's not my responsibility to lay out some whole long argument about what it might be otherwise if I have extensive evidence to support that it's a type of child abuse. Dr. Smith, you know there wasn't a single child psychologist or child psychiatrist that diagnosed what you were claiming. You're it, aware of that, right? That's also irrelevant. So you are the ultimate decider of me, uh, medical issues which you have minimal or no training in. I have extensive no training. training. Yes, I'm but you're not. It's a proffer. You can answer, Dr. Smith. I have extensive training in evaluating child abuse and neglect. Medical child abuse is a child abuse pediatric diagnosis. There is a parallel track in psychiatry where there's a thing called factitious disorder imposed on another, which is assessing the perpetrator or the caretaker in that scenario. But I don't need a psychiatric degree to assess medical child abuse. I'm very well trained to evaluate medical child abuse based on my child abuse pediatrics experience and board certification. Well, there's not a single child psychologist or psychiatrist that agreed with you. You do realize that, don't you? No, I don't. Well, name a child psychologist or psychiatrist that examined Maya Kowalski who agrees with you. Well, that wasn't their job to write in the report whether there's medical child abuse. So that specific thing documented by, for example, Dr. Cabot or um, Dr. Katzenstein, uh, I, don't, I don't know, honestly. I'd have to look back to see if they ever documented that as one of their diagnoses. But that's not their job. My job is to, do, to assess that. And if I present adequate um, evidence to the court, the court can act on that. Um, so, you know, the, the court has every ability to pull all these people in, including Dr. Kirkpatrick, including Dr. Hanna, I think they testified in the, in the dependency action, and, and if the judge decides that there's serious question about whether I'm right, then, you know, the, the court makes that decision based on the evidence that they receive. That's not my job to litigate the whole thing and put out all of the potential um, uh, possibilities in the case and say, I'm the child abuse pediatrician, but I don't really know if there was child abuse here because in this case, there clearly, in my opinion, was child abuse here. Yeah. So um, you did not put in any of the conclusions or any of the data from Eagle's Wings and those therapists and psychologists that saw the Kowalskis, did you? There was a licensed clinical social work intern who saw Maya and her family at Eagle's Wings. And I don't honestly know where that was in the pile of records when I was writing up my report. I kept um, writing part of the report, having to do other things, writing part of the report, having to do other things. And I, I inadvertently did not include that in my report. Well, you did research it enough to realize that Rebecca Johnson had a master's degree and over 20 years of experience as a therapist at Eagle's Wings. Did you not? Well, the question really in terms of my part I'm is whether... I'm just asking you if you knew that or not, ma'am. 
I knew she, ha I, I'd have to look and see exactly what her credentials were. I'd certainly, um, you know, uh, defer to you if you're reading her credentials off. But it's irrelevant unless she did the whole thing I did, looking at all these medical records and has expertise in medical child abuse, for her to be able to say one way or the other if there was child abuse or not. Okay, look, did anybody agree with your assessment that there was no um, CRPS? Yes, I believe they did. Who? Uh, I believe that uh, there were multiple people on the hospitalist team that didn't think she had it, and I believe that although there was probably some question about whether she might have some sort of amplified pain disorder, um, the uh, pain management team didn't think she had CRPS. Well, amazingly enough, we did have Dr. Elliott in here to testify, and he never said that she did not have it. None of the doctors so far testified, A, that they were experts in CRPS, or B, that she did not have it. Are you aware of that? No, I'm not. I wasn't supposed to watch any of the testimonies. So I have no idea what I'll people talk about. I'll that. From your investigation, though, at the time, did it come to your attention? Nowhere in any of the records did anyone who had any expertise in this, that is a pain management doctor, a neurologist, or a, uh, an anesthesiologist, ever agree with your assessment that there was no CRPS? I think I just answered that. Yes, I believe there were people that uh, had the same opinion. Okay. What did you check with Dr. Spiegel? a board-certified neurologist that treated Maya and confirmed CRPS. Objection assumes facts, not in evidence. Go ahead and answer. Uh, Dr. Spiegel uh, had this 10-year-old child do hyperbaric oxygen treatment, I believe, on 40 occasions in a row when she also got ketamine on some of the same days. So I wasn't terribly... Uh, worried about whether he thought or did not think that she had CRPS. Because you'd already decided in your mind that a board certified pediatrician with his years of experience was not qualified to render an opinion, uh, an opinion on that. Is that right? Objection misrepresents the, the credentials and uh, I asked for comment on another crumb bill and other Go ahead and answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dr. Barr. Yeah. A board certified uh, neurologist. He testified and confirmed CRPS. Did you put that in your report? I don't know that I specifically said um, that he said that diagnosis. I think, um, as I recall, without going into the stack, um, that I did say in the history that Dr. Kirkpatrick had diagnosed her with that. Um, Those people might have had that opinion. I don't think, based on my review of the CRPS literature and um, discussions with a uh, physician since then, and in the context of all the evidence that there was of medical child abuse, um, that Dr. Barr's opinion, if that was his, that she had CRPS, um, was reliable. Okay, so now <laughs> Dr. Spiegel is not reliable, and he's a neurologist. At least will you agree that neurology and anesthesiology are the two areas that are most involved in the investigation of complex regional pain syndrome? I imagine those are people that typically evaluate and treat um, patients with complex regional pain syndrome, sure. But not all neurologists and um, and uh, pain management or anesthesia, I'm sorry, not all neurologists or anesthesiologists are, if you will, created equally. There are some who practice at a very high level and when I, having reviewed medical records from all kinds of providers all over the state and even other parts of the country uh, for 35 years, read through information and see all the supporting information that they have and compare that with other information that I gather in my medical record review, I can assess whether the person that, you know, made thousands of dollars was reliable or not. 
And I didn't find those people to be particularly reliable in terms of their diagnosis, even though I certainly included their information in my report. Dr. Hanna, a anesthesiologist with over 25 years of experience in treating CRPS. You didn't put his confirmation, or excuse me, he did a diagnosis of CRPS in your report either, did you? I believe in the history, I made reference to that. I, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did say that, that he, um, you know, made that diagnosis. But this is a doctor who was giving a child, a 10-year-old child who was on the small side, a thousand milligrams of ketamine, anywhere between eight and 32 milligrams of Versed, doses of Zofran, dose 1,750 milligrams typically of magnesium, all at the same time in an outpatient setting with no documentation of, medical, of um, vital signs. And there was indication in the records that appeared to me to suggest that the family member was the person monitoring the pulse oximeter. So that person, to me, is not particularly reliable in terms of whether this child needed the treatment that she was getting, whether he made an accurate diagnosis or not. So I put his information in my report. Yes, I discounted his diagnosis. And of course, you discounted Dr. Cantu's confirmation of CRPS. Well, I never got any records from Dr. Cantu, so I couldn't really address that whole um, situation other than from the WordPress blog. This person put a nine-year-old child in a ketamine coma for days. It took her probably about a week to just be able to be discharged from the hospital after that. So I, I didn't find him reliable from what I saw. Uh, all right, so if I'm understanding you, the fact that three different treating anesthesiologists specializing in CRPS, two different neurologists specializing in the treating of CRPS, you know more. Fair? I don't know more. I, as I said, I looked at their information, and based on what was done with this particular child, I did not find their opinion to be reliable. And who elected you to be the judge of whether all of these board certified physicians were reliable? Nobody. I presented it to a real judge who made a determination. Well, isn't it true, ma'am, that you are not a medical investigator? You are, in fact, a medical prosecutor. That's absolute nonsense. Because an investigator would include both sides of the story and let the judge decide, right? No. The, the Child Protection Team Medical uh, Director will assess whether there's medical evidence to support a diagnosis of child abuse, and then the dependency attorney will present that to the judge. And the other side gets attorneys also. There were five in this case. And they present all the information, and then the judge um, it, it tries to decide, you know, what, who, who, whose, whose information is more reliable. Here, under oath, are you telling us, are you an investigator or are you a prosecutor I am of neither. the information? I'm a medical doctor who is an expert in child abuse pediatrics. Mr. Anderson, I'm giving you very wide latitude. I'm done. You're finished? Yep. Okay. Mr. Hunter, anything further in proffer? Very briefly, Your Honor. When you spoke with Dr. Kirkpatrick and he warned you off, did he tell you that he had last seen this child 10 months before the conversation? I honestly don't recall if I already knew that. I might have already known that. And when you wrote your report, you had the Tampa General Hospital records, the Lurie Children's Hospital records, the All Children's records predating October of 2016, correct? Correct. And all those hospitalizations with all those specialists that saw this child, you see any of them suggest 
that CRPS was the diagnosis? No, and multiple were experts in complex regional pain syndrome. Thank you. Is the proffer complete? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, Madam Court Reporter, note that the proffer is now closed. Dr. Sally Smith, you had looked at a little report during your testimony. Can you hand that to yes. me? Yes. I'm going to hand and it to the you clerk. You can keep it if you want. Okay. I'm going to yeah. hand it to the clerk. Let's mark it as whatever the next number for plaintiff for ID purposes. And just tell us what that number is. So the, the report that Dr. Smith looked at during her testimony in front of the jury is ID'd as 2804. It's not in evidence. Um, May, I'm sorry. I think you said in front of the jury. I think you meant not. No. Earlier during oh, her sorry. testimony, she had pulled out a, a report, and that is what we, we just um, identified. Now. Does Dr. Sally Smith, is she released or does she need to remain under subpoena? Uh, she's released by plaintiff. Released, Your Honor. You can watch her. <laughs> if you are released, you are no longer subject to the rule of sequestration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.